Boy, aren't you so thankful for that. What a powerful song. I am not what I used to be. Amen? How many of you rejoice in that? I am not what I used to be. You know, yesterday I went to, to see Virginia Tech play Liberty University. And you know, I'm a Liberty graduate, and so... I thought, man, I'd love to go and see that game. And I looked at the price of tickets, and I thought, ah, oh, we, nah, that's not going to happen. And uh, Buzz Fleischer came up and called me this week. He said, would you like to go to the Liberty game? I said, well, you know I would. I'd love to. And he said, well, I've got four tickets. If you want to go, take your family and go. So I was just like, wow, this is great. I've never been to a college game. And so we go into the stadium, and I've got my Liberty shirt on, and there's just a massive sea of Virginia Tech people. There's very few Liberty people in, in comparison to all of the all of the Hokey fans that are there. As a matter of fact, many times I, I received some very dirty looks. I thought, man, I, I may have to protect myself here today. You know, I mean just people just looked at you so hateful. I mean they are just I think they bleed orange, you know. I mean just it was unbelievable. And uh, but as I sat there and I watched all these people come. I just couldn't help but think, man, wouldn't it be wonderful if people would come to Jesus like that? Man, wouldn't that be great? And then as I sit there, I'm saying, you know, I can't, I can't help but think this way. All of the excitement on the field, all of the fans just shouting out hokies and, and uh, you know, these little songs that they, they sing and they have this thing that they do every, every time they have a home game and there are a lot of faithful fans and and I remember when they, the Hokies came out on the field. Now, when Liberty came out on the field, it was boo. You know, everybody's booing them, you know. And, uh, and I'm just, you know, my son and I were standing up, woo! Everybody's looking at us like we're crazy. And, uh, and then here come all these Hokie football players on the field. And the place erupts. I mean, cannons going off. The crowd just screaming, you know, just top of their lungs and people have this dance they're jumping up and down i mean everybody 70 around seventy thousand people and so i'm standing there thinking is this stadium even going to hold us i mean the whole thing was moving and buzz had kind of prepared me for that but i was just blown away at how excited now, i know in our home we get excited over football but you know we get excited over things that we love don't we I mean, don't we get excited over things that we love? I mean, what we love is, is what drives us. What we love is what excites us. I know today is my 17th wedding anniversary today. I'm excited about today, you know? 17 years together, same woman. I love her with all my heart. I'm so blessed. It's exciting when you love someone or you love something. It, 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 it drives you. It drives you to do things you wouldn't normally do, right? And I just sat there and I watched all those hokey fans and I thought, man, church ought to be like this. You know, when, you, when you're when singing a song, I Am Redeemed, I mean, we ought to be, woo, you know, and clapping and yeah. I mean, are you redeemed? I mean, see what I mean? Are you redeemed? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do we even know what that means this morning? I mean, come on. You get, do you have a past? you ever done something you're not proud of that you don't like? Were you a lost sinner one time at some point in your life? And today, you know, the grace and the love and the, the joy of Jesus Christ is in your heart. You've been redeemed. Someone paid a debt that you couldn't pay. Hello? Right? You couldn't pay it. And he stepped up on the cross and paid a debt that he didn't owe. Took your place. It's a whole lot better than a Hokies game. Just things like things are just so backwards in our world today. So messed up in our churches. I mean, we should be celebrating and rejoicing like that. It should be an eruption of applause and of praise. Do you even get what I'm saying? I mean, do you agree with me? It should be this way. Children of God should be excited people. You know, we should be the most joyous people, the most excited people. Hello, right? Am I the only one that feels that way? I know you weren't there to see the Hokie game, but you kind of understand what I'm saying. You know, we've been talking for several weeks about being faithful. 
And I know Dream, I kind of alluded to it this morning. I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back soon. I do believe that. And, uh, and, and if you've got your Bible, let's turn to Revelation 22, 12. I've read these words since I was a little boy. And these words have always captivated me. These words have always been encouraging to me. These words have always drove me to want to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we are talking about being faithful, and I want to share them with you. And kind of the theme verse of what we've been talking about the last several weeks is 1 Corinthians 4, <coughs> verse 2. And it says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. And we've been talking about this for, for five or six weeks now, about being faithful. And you know what? If you sat here today and you believe the Lord Jesus Christ could come back at any time. Guess what? Now is your time more than ever to be faithful and to live your life in honor and reverence to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here in Revelation 22, I want us to look at this passage. I want to speak today on this idea of being faithful until He comes. You know, this, this Revelation 22 and verse 12, it is the last promise in the Bible. And you know what? It is, it is also the last promise that comes from the lips of Jesus. This is not only the last promise in the Bible, but the last promise of Jesus. And here's what it says. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me. Now watch this. To give to everyone according to his work. Don't miss that. You see, we are saved by grace. Someone said, I cannot work my soul to save that work my Lord has done, but I will work like any slave for the love of God's dear Son. You know what? I am saved by grace, but I am rewarded. One day I'm going to be rewarded according to my works. According to the work that I've done for the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am coming quickly in this particular verse that we're looking at this morning. He means simply this when he says I'm coming quickly. It means this in its original language. He could come at any moment. Amen. And now if you are familiar with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, if you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, you will find out what a little more of what that coming is going to look like. It's going to be in the twinkling of an eye and the Lord is going to come. And everything is going to change very suddenly for those who know Christ and also for those who don't. You know, in the next moment, you and I could be standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and at the judgment seat of Christ. I mean, think about that just for a moment. I mean, you and I are sitting here right now, but that could change very quickly. Many of you, you have plans today, don't you? You have plans for tomorrow. It is Labor Day weekend, I know we have many people out on va you know, vacationing, one last hurrah before they dig in and say, all right, it's time to get serious about school and, and work and all these things. And so one last fling here, you know, and people are out. But you know what? Everything can change very quickly. And you know what? You and I could literally be today standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. And in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, very sobering passage here. It deals with the judgment seat of Christ. And it's also mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3 and Romans 14. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, Jesus talks about giving rewards. And he's talking about the place of reward being the judgment seat of Christ. I want to tell you something. In this moment, the Hokies beating the flames is not going to matter. In this moment, a lot of things that you and I look to as trophies and crowns is not going to matter. I, I can tell you a lot of things that we work really hard for in life. A lot of those things, I'm not saying, hey, I would never stand up here and tell you not to work hard. I would stand up here and tell you to work hard. By the way, the Bible gives us that message. It says if you don't work, you don't eat. Right? Everybody in America needs to hear that message. We need to get back to working hard in America. But listen, a lot of the things that we work hard for is going to be very insignificant in this day. It's going to be what we did for Jesus. 
Now I want you to understand something about this judgment. This judgment of, of condemnation, or this is not a judgment of condemnation. This is a judgment. This is an evaluation of your deeds. This is an evaluation of the work that you have done for the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the time. Please hear me. That you're going to be rewarded for every visit you've made. Every song that you've sang. Every dime. Every, every amount of money that you've given to the Lord. Every class you've ever taught. Every service you've ever attended. Everything that you've ever done. Every person you've ever taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to be evaluated upon what you've done for Jesus. And He's going to evaluate our motives. He's going to evaluate our ministries. And he's going to evaluate our management. And then he's going to give us some rewards. The Lord Jesus is going to give us some rewards. Now, 2 Corinthians 5.10, he says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether they are good or whether they are bad. Now, this judgment right here is the Bema judgment. There's, there's several judgments in the Bible. This is the one for every child of God. It's called the Bema judgment. Now, the Bema was a raised platform, kind of like what I'm standing on right now, and it faced a massive field. I've been there. The platform is still standing there today, and there's a massive field out in front of it that is level and flat. And what would happen is they would go out and compete in different Olympic games. And in their competition, when it was over, they would be rewarded for what they've done. Now, kind of like the Olympic games that we recently was able to observe. You know, whatever you've done for Jesus, you're going to be rewarded for. That's what this judgment is all about. And so it is saying that you should be motivated Listen to me. We should be motivated. We should be found faithful at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus has made you a promise. I don't want you to miss it. His promise this morning is, I am coming. He's coming, folks. And, and you know what? He could come at any moment. And at any moment, any moment, he could come. And at that moment, we're going to stand before him. And he's going to give out some rewards. Now, rewards are important. I don't want you to miss this. You see, we are saved by grace, but we are rewarded according to our works. I remember one day I was just kind of daydreaming. You ever do that? Some of you are pretty good at it. You're doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One day I was just kind of daydreaming, and it was like in the middle of my daydreaming, the Lord just kind of smacked me real good one time. And, and all of a sudden, I went from daydreaming about what I was thinking about to this scene of what I'm sharing with you right now. And in this scene, it took me to, uh, to an area of Scripture. In this scene, there were all of the believers, all children of God were there. We were in heaven. Jesus, God, was sitting on the Bema seat. And everyone was being judged. What we're getting ready to talk about is people were giving crowns. And they were taking these crowns, if you will, and they were laying these crowns at the feet of Jesus, which is what you and I are going to do. But I want you to understand something very clearly up front. We're going to look at all the crowns this morning. There's five of them. The crowns don't look the same. As a matter of fact, if you stood back at a distance and you saw someone carrying a crown, at the judgment seat, you're going to know what that crown means. You're going to be able to identify it. You're going to see it for what it is. It's going to stand out from all of the other crowns. It's going to mean something. I'm going to tell you what it's going to mean here in a minute. But it's going to have a significant meaning. Now listen, in heaven, there are going to be those who are standing back and watching all of this unfold, and they don't have any crowns. They're not given any rewards. You say, well, you know what? I'm okay with that. I just want to get into heaven. You won't be okay with that. Trust me, you won't be okay with that. And let me paint the scene for you. I want to give you the crowns 
that are going to be rewarded to the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as your pastor, I want you to be faithful because I know this day is coming that we're going to stand before the Lord. And you cannot, you cannot come up to me and say, I wish you would have told me. I'm telling you, there's coming a day. Hear me. And there's coming a day where we're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and we're going to worship Him by giving Him the crowns in which He has given to us. And you know what? On that day, listen, I want you to have something to go to Him and worship Him with. Do you understand what I'm saying? So let's look at these crowns real quick. What they are, how you can get them in life. You know, right now you're... This is not a trial run, ladies and gentlemen. This is the real thing. You understand? You're not going to die and come back as something else and get to do this all over again. You're not going to turn your life into the Lord Jesus Christ and Him kind of grade you on the curve and say, oh, these are all the mistakes you made. Go back and try it again. I was thankful for teachers like that in school. <laughs> you know, that would say, oh, here's where you messed up. Try it again. Okay, great. And, uh, but you know what? That's not going to happen at this day. At this day, we're going to turn our lives in and we're going to be rewarded with one of the five or several of the five. Number one here, I want you to get this. There is the crown of incorruption. Write that down. Number one, the crown of incorruption. Here is one of the rewards that's going to be handed out at this day. Now, as you look at these crowns, the first crown that you see, if you could jot this verse down, is 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25, you see of this crown. Now, each of these crowns should encourage you in your walk with the Lord. Don't miss this. That here in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24, we see the incorruptible crown. It says this, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Did you get that? Run in such a way that you would get this crown. Okay? Now, no young man really would contend in the games unless he was a Greek citizen or a Roman citizen. And so, unless you were Greek or unless you were a Roman citizen, you couldn't compete in these games. And so, really what that is, is just a forerunner. It's just a picture. It is saying, listen, that no one who is not a child of God, if you're not a child of God, you're not going to get these rewards. And so in order to obtain these rewards in heaven, you must be a child of the one true king. And so no person can even run the race until he's a child of God. You're not even entered into the race. Until you become a Christian. But when you become a Christian. Listen when you become a Christ follower. You are entered into the race. And you're running for this prize. And you know the race. Is called the Christian life. And when you get when you become a Christian. God begins watching. God begins evaluating. God begins re recording. How you're running in the race. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25 says. And everyone who competes. For the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Did you catch that? You see, he's talking about how the athletes at these Olympic Games will discipline themselves. They will train hard. They will beat their bodies into subjection. They will undergo suffering. They will undergo great effort and great teaching and great training and they will put years into it and effort into it to be the very best that they can be. But don't miss this. The Bible says that this is in vain in comparison to what you do for Jesus Christ. You know, think about the crown jewels of England. 1937, the crown jewels of England were estimated to be about $30 million that one crown. That one crown. $30 million. Incredible. You know, I was reading about that crown. The crown, in the crown are, are five <coughs> huge rubies, 11 beautiful emeralds, 17 large sapphires, 277 beautiful pearls. The ladies, you're going to like this. 2,783 diamonds 
are in that crown. Man, wouldn't you love to have something like that? Today, it is estimated to be worth around $11 billion, that crown. But you know what? One day that crown is going to be left behind. One day that crown is not going to mean anything. One day that crown is going to be very insignificant. And so what is the corruptible, the incorruptible crown? What is this incorruptible crown? As Paul compares it with these Grecian athletic games, these people who discipline themselves and they train and they work. Listen, what is it saying? It is saying this. If you want this incorruptible crown, the first crown that the Bible talks about, then you know what? You've got to give your all for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what? Maybe how you used to train in one area and you used to work so hard in one area. Now you're going to take that effort and you're going to put it into working and serving and striving for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God expects us to work. Not for the applause of men, not for fame, not for financial security, not for this crown of worldly position, but for the incorruptible crown that Jesus will present to us on this day. This is a crown given to a person who runs the race. I want to ask you, are you running the race for Jesus? Are you making your life count so that you can get this incorruptible crown? Let me give you number two here, the crown of righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, Paul talks about going to be with the Lord. And he said in the previous verse, he said this, the Apostle Paul, he said, I fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And then he says in verse 8, finally, listen to this. Listen to what he says. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, here it is, but to those who love his appearing. Did you see that? The crown of righteousness? How can you win the crown of righteousness? How can you earn the crown of righteousness and have that crown one day when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul says that this is a crown that is not just for him, but it is available to all of us who love his appearing. Do you love his appearing? Do you love his appearing? He is coming again one day. Amen. Are you looking forward to that? Amen. Do you love the idea of him coming again? 1 John chapter 2 and verse 28, the Bible says that we are to live our lives in such a way that we would not be ashamed of standing before the Lord Jesus Christ and being judged and being evaluated. Listen, Paul said that, that this crown is for those who have fought a good fight. Are you fighting the fight? You know what? I want to tell you something. The Christian life is a battle. Are you with me? It is a fight. It is a battle. It is a battle with sin. It is a battle. It's a battle with Satan. It's a battle over souls. Amen. It is a fight. It is a battle. And so, you know, people, they get into the Christian life and they expect that everything's going to be perfect. And you know what? Now I'm living for Jesus and everything's going to go smooth. And, and, you know, they stay in the Christian life. And after a while they see, you know what? I'm still fighting a battle. I'm still battling with things. And I want to tell you this, ladies and gentlemen. The more you do for the Lord Jesus Christ, the more you better learn to pray. Because this, there's this thing called spiritual warfare. There's this idea that motion causes friction. When you are doing something for the kingdom of God, Satan is going to come and he's going to try to discourage you. He's going to try to shut you down. He doesn't want you to stand before the Lord one day having these crowns to go to Jesus and worship him. Are you following me? He doesn't want this. And I want to tell you something. The fight is not going to be over until Jesus comes. The battle is not going to be over until Jesus comes. And so you're to fight. You are to fight a good fight if you want to win this crown. Paul also said, I have finished my course. You know what? He's talking about a race. He started a race. And he said, I have finished this race. I want you to understand something. It is not a matter of how well you start. Think about this with me for a minute. Paul said, I finished my race. I ran the whole race. L listen to me very carefully. It's not how you start. You see, you can start very well. And you can get ahead of everybody else. I love the 
yesterday, yesterday's game when Liberty was behind and they started playing really good defense. And all, now all of a sudden I'm sitting there looking at the scoreboard and the score is 16 to 13. Liberty is beating Virginia Tech. Total silence just like right now. I was like, I love this. This is great. You know what? Liberty stopped playing the football that they were playing. As a matter of fact, their offense never even got started. I want to tell you something. It doesn't matter how good you start. If you stop at some point during the race, everybody else is going to beat you. Does that make sense? You can't stop running the race. You know what? And let me tell you, this is not a 100-yard dash in living the Christian life. This is a marathon. Okay? This is a marathon. And remember this. Anybody can start. Anybody can start. But you know what? This crown is going to be given to those who finish the race. Who finish the race. And so, you know what? Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking to myself, man, I've not been doing so well. I'm not running this race so well. Listen to me. Start running today. Never too late to start running Amen. until the Lord comes back or you go home and be with the Lord. You know what? And another thing the enemy's going to do is he's going to try to bring up your past. How many of you could connect with that last song that the praise team sang? You know what? That's what the enemy does. He wants to beat you up with your past. And let me just say this. Your past is not the past if it's impacting your present. Many times what we call the past is not the past. Because it's still haunting us today. You need to understand a couple of things. One of them is the forgiveness of God. And the grace of God, number two. And you need through those two things, let your past be the past. Listen, you can't move forward looking back. Amen? You can't run a race looking back at the past. No, listen, you run this race and you focus on what's in front of you, amen? And you keep your eyes on this goal. You keep your eyes on that day when you and I are going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? Let the past be the past. Amen. It's a whole lot easier for the past to be the past when you're focusing on the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And you're focusing on, hey, these crowns and what am I going to do for the Lord Jesus Christ today? You know, Paul said, I have finished the race. You know what else he said? He said, I've kept the faith. What does that mean? He's talking about those who live their lives according to the word of God. He said, I've lived my life according to what the word of God has said. And so you know what? If you want this crown, then you need to be seeking to do these things, being faithful. Let me give you the third crown mentioned in the word of God. It's the crown of life. Our verse is James chapter 1 and verse 12. I want you to listen to what the Bible says. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. How many of you face temptation? I was talking to Rosie and she said, you know what? It's wonderful getting old because we're just not tempted like we used to be. <laughs> but you're still tempted. And you know what? Temptation is going to be one of those things that... It's going, hey, listen, Satan's going to continue to do it. It's not going to go away. And you've got to learn how to deal with it. Look at this. Blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You know, here is a special crown of recognition. In heaven, when people see that you are rewarded with this crown, they're going to identify the crown. They're going to know what the crown looks like. And for those who are carrying it, they're going to look and they're going to say, that person went through a great deal of suffering and yet they remain faithful. You know, the word for temptation means trial here. How many of you are facing trials? I've asked you this many times. How many of you want to give up at times? You know what? Those who, who face trials and temptations and don't give up and they keep pressing through, this crown is for you. This crown is going to be rewarded to you. Jesus in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, he was talking to a very persecuted church. And he was talking to these people who were being persecuted for their faith. And here's what he said to them. Be faithful until death. And I will give you the crown of life. 
You see what he's saying here? Be, be faithful. Don't quit. Whatever comes your way, don't quit. You know, I was thinking about Elizabeth. I've been thinking and praying for her a lot. Here she's gone through all of this chemo and all of this radiation. And all through it, she has sang the praises of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And she texted me just the other day. <clears throat> And she said, they have found four spots on my spine. And there are other spots in different areas of my body. But you know what? She is still singing the praises of Jesus. You know, we, what, we have people in the family of God here who are suffering. They are suffering in their health. They are suffering in other ways. And yet they are remaining faithful. And I want to tell you something. This crown of life is going to be given to them. Because they have been faithful and they, they remain faithful. And even in the midst of trials and persecution, this temptation, this word temptation, means trial. And as they are going through trials, they are remaining faithful. And they're going to be given this crown. I want to encourage you, be faithful. Remember, I've, I've told you this a couple of times. Maybe you can't sing. You know, maybe you can't speak. Maybe you, you wouldn't feel comfortable teaching. But maybe you wouldn't feel comfortable doing something else for the Lord. But you know what you can do? Listen to me. You can be faithful. Amen. Everybody can be faithful. Amen? Amen? And that's God's premium. That's what God wants you to do. Be faithful. Let me give you number four here. The crown of rejoicing. We'll get through these quickly. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19 is our verse. It is a crown for winning souls. Paul is speaking to a young church of new believers that have not been saved very long. And here's what he says. For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? It is not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at His coming. What is he talking about? He's saying the greatest joy of heaven is when someone walks up to you and says, You know what? I'm here. Because of you. I wouldn't be here today if you didn't send that missionary. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you being faithful. And you know what? Through you, I received the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God's computer records every single time you share the gospel with somebody, it is written down. It is recorded and it will not be forgotten. You may forget it. You may not remember it. But he will always remember it. And you're going to be given a crown. We, we've called it in the church for years in church terminology, the soul winner's crown. I want to challenge you today. If this church is going to be a church that reaches souls for the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what? It's going to take a collected effort. Amen. All of us working together. We have light and night coming up. What a blessing that's going to be. What an opportunity to have over 2,000 people here and to be able to share the gospel with them. This year we're adding a haunted trail. Why are we doing that at the end of the trail? Because we, we love to scare people. I love to scare people. I'm just being honest. I like, I enjoy scaring people. You know, killed a black snake out here the other day and Pastor Josh, he is, I don't know if he's in here. He'll, he'll hear this. Maybe I'll say it in the, the second service. But you know what? He, he scares so easily. And I love. I had that big snake pinned down. And I said, Josh, go get me a stick. He looked at me and he said, uh-uh. I'm not bringing you a stick. I'm not getting close to that snake. I mean, he would be walking in the hall. I'll hear him coming, you know, his keys jangling. I'll hide behind the corner and jump out. You know, that always scares him. And I love scaring him. So we're going to scare some people. But the end of the trail we're going to have tents set up and we're going to share with them about Jesus Christ. That's why we're going to do it. <clears throat> you know what? Any way, anything, anything we can do to get the gospel to people, that's what we need to be doing. And you know what? Not only as a church, but also as individuals, we need to be sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me give you number five here, and we'll wrap this up. The crown of glory. This is the fifth crown, the last of the crowns that's mentioned in the Bible, the last of the rewards that will be handed out on this day. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2 to 4, it says this. The Bible is talking to pastors. 
And God is, God is talking to me. God is speaking directly to pastors. And he says this. He says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Now, I want you to hang in here and hear this. Because this is not just primarily the pastors, okay? This is not just for pastors. There, there, is, there is something in here for you. I want you to hear it. But, but for pastors, it, it says, I am to feed the flock of God. That is, I am to listen to what it is that God lays on my heart to say. And I am to bring what God has shared with me. And I am to share it with you. Whether it's popular, whether it's good, whether it's, you know, whether it's something that's going to appeal to you or not, I am to share what God shares with me. And you know what I was thinking about that? That is what a good parent would do, right? I mean, if your child always wants ice cream, but you know he needs to eat vegetables, you know what? Sometimes you've got to feed them and make them eat what they don't always want. Does that make sense? And so, you know what? As a pastor, I've got to do the same thing. I've got to give you sometimes what you don't want to hear, but we all need to hear it, especially if it is from the Word of God. And secondly, I am told that I'm to be an overseer of the flock. I am to be one who leads you in the way that we should go as a church. You know, let me give you the third thing. We are to be an example to the flock. And I want to tell you, this is a great challenge. It's a great challenge for me. In all honesty, as I thought about this challenge, I thought, man, you know what? There are people in this church that are, I'm sure, a much better example to the flock than I am. And yet God has called me to do this. And this is one of the things that as a pastor, I take very serious seeking to be the example that I know God wants me to be. But guess what? In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 41, Jesus said this, He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. And so that verse is very interesting because it, it says this, if you, if you believe in what your pastor tells you and you trust his heart and you know he's, he's seeking after the Lord and you get on board with that and you support the vision and you rally behind what it is that God's calling the church to do as God leads the pastor, that verse is telling us that you're going to get the same reward. Are you following me? You know, I can tell you that this church has a rich history in supporting the pastor of the church. You know, I know that there is a church literally, I'm not going to give you too many details, but it's really close to our church. And one day they called me while I was pastor here and asked if I would be interested in coming and being their pastor. And it literally is in walking distance. And I thought to myself, you know what, that, number one, that is so low. If I was looking for a pastor, I wouldn't call a pastor that's at a church right down the road. But secondly, I would never go to that church because they have a history of a great turnover, which means they don't support the pastor, and the pastor doesn't feel too overly loved by the people. You know? And I don't want to be a part of that. You know what? I'm just going to become one of the guys that doesn't stay very long. You know? And so I don't want to be that guy. But you know what? As a church, you have a history. You have a history of getting behind the guy that God has brought here and supporting and being on board and helping the church to move forward. And so I want to tell you, this crown, if you do that, this crown is going to be given to you as well. Amen. And so let me just conclude by saying, taking you back to the very truth that one day we are going to stand before the Lord. One day we are going to be in His presence and all of the angels and all of the hosts of heaven, they are all going to be there. And in Revelation chapter 4, verse 10 and 11, it tells us exactly what we're going to do. Whether you, listen, whether you have one crown or whether you have two, three, four of these crowns, four of the five, it tells us what we're going to do with these crowns. Listen to it. It says, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they take their crowns and they cast them before the throne saying, 
You are worthy, O oh Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and they were created. Amen. Wouldn't it be tragic to be at this monumental, life changing, eye opening event? That will be forever remembered. I mean, this, this is one of those things you will never be able to get out of your mind for all of eternity. And wouldn't it be something to be at this event and here people are worshiping Jesus by taking all of the work that they have done in their life, whatever crowns they've been awarded, and they take these crowns and they bow down before the Lord and they lay them down at His feet in worship. You know, one reason why I believe that they do this is, you know what, whatever we do that has any eternal value, it is Him doing it through us anyways. Amen. Right? And yet it is Jesus, listen, how precious it is that Jesus says, I reward you for all of the work that you've done. Here's your reward. But ultimately, you and I as Christ followers, we understand that whatever we do that has any eternal value, it is the Holy Spirit of God inside of us doing it. And so we take these crowns and we lay them at the feet of Jesus in worship. What a service that's going to be. What a time that is going to be. Listen to me carefully. I want you to be able to take place to play an active role in that service. I want you to have crowds. You know, I believe many times we get so caught up in serving this world and accumulating the goods of this world. Listen, that this world becomes only a mere distraction of what you and I really ought to be working and laboring. Are you following? Last week we preached on serving. Just preached on serving. Serving in Awana, serving in, in uh, you know, youth ministry, serving in all these different areas of ministry, serving in care ministry. And I am pleased to stand here today and to tell you that many of you went and you signed up and you enlisted to begin serving the Lord. And you know what? Around 60% of the church last week stood, their, stood to their feet and said, you know what? I'm going to have a deeper commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to begin serving Him at a greater level than I have been or I'm going to begin serving Him. And you know what? If that be the case, our entire church is about to change. Amen. The kingdom of God is going to be more populated because of you. Amen? Amen. And you know what? Your reward is going to be these crowds. Let's go to the Lord together in prayer. As we close here today, now I want to ask you today, I made a statement today that simply says, you know what? You're not even in the race. You're not even in the game to get one of these crowns if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so I want to give you an opportunity this morning to get in the race. I want to give you an opportunity this morning to come to Jesus, to enlist, to become a Christ follower. If God has spoken to your heart today, you want to live for the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to invite you right now to pray a simple prayer with me. You say, Pastor Jay, I want to know Jesus as my Savior. I, I want to be redeemed like we sang about earlier. You know what? I want to know Him. He died on the cross for me. He loves me. I want to know Him. I want a relationship with Him. Would you come to Him today? Maybe you say a simple prayer like this with me. This prayer just gives you the opportunity to communicate your heart to Jesus and to invite Jesus to be your personal Savior. Would you pray something like this with me? Lord Jesus, I come to you today. And Lord, I thank you that you died on the cross for my sin. 
Lord, I am thankful that you're willing to save me today. And Lord Jesus, I ask you to do that. I ask you to save me. Lord, forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of the things that I've done in my past. And Lord, save me today, Lord Jesus. That I may begin living and serving you. If you pray that with me this morning, would you slip your hand up? Would you take a moment and just raise your hand and say, Pastor Jay, I ask Jesus today to save me. Amen. I see your hands. Anyone else? Pastor Jay, I ask Jesus to save me today. Would you pray for me this morning? Yes. Praise the Lord. You put your hands down. Dear friend, what about the rest of us? I don't know about you, but I can just tell you how I think to myself sometimes. I think, Lord, I can do more for you. Lord, I want to do more for you. I know just last week I was praying, God, God broadened the territory of influence. God, open up the doors to do more for you. God, raise up more people to do more for you and your kingdom. How many of you feel that way this morning? Lord, I know I can do more. God, I know I can do more. Lord, I want one of those crowns. I want to be faithful to you, faithful and living for you. Listen, if God spoke to your heart in that way this morning, would you just raise your hand and say, Lord, you know, God, you spoke to my heart today. Would you slip your hand up? Several hands. I'm right there with you. I want to do more. I want to do more for the kingdom. God knows that's my heart. Listen, God spoke to your heart this morning. As we stand on our feet, would you come to the altar? Would you take this moment and come to Jesus and get at this altar and talk to him for a moment? If he spoke to you, would you come and just speak to him? Let us stand together as we close. If God spoke to your heart today, would you come? Would you come to this altar and say, Lord, I know you singled me out. I know you spoke to me. I know I, I, I can sense your, your tugging upon my heart. I, I can hear you ever so clearly this morning. And I'm coming, Lord, just to say yes to what it is that you've spoken to me about. Would you come? Those that raise their hands today to be saved, would you come? Would you come this morning? Just come up here and take me by the hand. Would you do that? this morning and she said she said my granddaughter wants to be saved she asked me this week to take her to church this Sunday so she could give her life to Christ Amen. Chelsea and Brianna came forward Brianna right is that right yeah came forward today and uh, to give their lives to Jesus Christ Amen. and they want to live for Jesus isn't that precious Amen. now let me tell you it was it was I know a grandmother and a, grand, a granddad that had a whole lot to do with that. Is that true? Yes. And you know what? The Lord working in hearts. Thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. Welcome to the family of God, you girls. 
What a bless. Isn't that sweet? Isn't that precious? You know, I remember my two little boys, and I just, I never went to my boys and said, do you want to accept Jesus? I never did that. I felt in my heart the best way to do it was to pray for them. The best way to do it was to live it out because it's not toys are us, it's kids are us. And so, and so to, to try to live it out at home and to pray. And every single night, I prayed for their soul. And that, that time that they came to me and said, Dad, I want to know how to be saved. That's a great time. Amen? Amen. Well, let's talk about it. What's on your mind? What's on your heart? Tell me about it. I'm so thankful. Let's go to our Lord in prayer. I'm so thankful for these two sweet girls that came to Jesus today. I'm so thankful for those of you today who are sensitive to the Spirit of God and those who, who come and are just honest before the Lord. I thank God for that. If you're here with us today, I'm so thankful you're, that you're here. If, Maybe you're visiting here with us today. I'm so thankful that you came today to worship our Lord and our Savior. What a blessing. So thankful <laughs> you're, that you're here. Thanks for coming and worshiping with us. Let us go to the Lord in prayer as we close. Brother Keith, would you close us in prayer, please? Thank you. see was the struggle haunted I ghost that lived in my past bound up in shackles of all my failures one Got this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight. It's already been won. And I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains and wipe away. Stain. I'm not who I used to be. I am redeemed. I'm redeemed. All my life I have been called on. You whisper, child, lift up your head. I remember, oh God, you're not done with me yet. And I am redeemed. You set me free. So I'll shake off these heavy chains. Now I'm not who I used to be Because I don't have to be The old man inside of me Cause his day is long dead and gone Because I've got a new name A new life, I'm not the same And a hope that will carry me home I am redeemed
Take off these heavy chains And wipe away every stain Cause I'm not who I used to be I am redeemed You set me free Thank God redeemed.